All right, let's talk about male gametogenesis. And of course, here we're talking about sperm production. Male gametes are sperm. You're probably familiar with what mature sperm look like. Mature sperm have a small head, which really contains nothing but a nucleus, and a flagella that they can beat to swim. They also contain this little cap called an acrosome. This contains enzymes which help the sperm to get through the uh, layers of sort of gelatinous material that surround the secondary oocyte, so enabling fertilization. There's also a little attached piece just outside of the sperm cell body called the mid piece. This contains mitochondria. In order to power that, that flagella, that tail, we need mitochondria to do metabolism to produce our ATP to let this thing run. But let's talk about where these come from. So in the testes, so we'll draw a testis here. It's a sort of a oval organ. On the surface of the testis, we have a coiled up tube called the epididymis. which leads into another tube called the vas deferens. This tube, the vas deferens, is going to be what carries sperm away from the testis and up into the body where we will then join, the vas deferens passes up and joins up with the urethra or right around the prostate. So as we take sperm up there, when we're making semen, we're going to add other things to it from the prostate and other areas. We'll get to that. But let's talk about where these sperm come from. So here inside the testis, we've got lots and lots of these coiled things called seminiferous tubules. And it's in between these where the sperm are made. So in here, we've got diploid cells called spermatogonia. Those spermatogonia can divide by mitosis, remember that's regular cell division, to produce more spermatogonia. So they can just keep making more spermatogonia, cloning themselves effectively. But these spermatogonia can also, some of them will then undergo meiosis. So this one is going to undergo meiosis. It's going to duplicate its DNA. And undergo these two meiotic cell divisions. to produce four haploid cells, although these are not the final sperm. These are, these are known as spermatocytes. So my spermatogonia can undergo mitosis to make more spermatogonia, or they can undergo meiosis to produce four haploid spermatocytes. These actually then can divide up themselves by mitosis into more spermatocytes and so on. And then eventually these mature into sperm. So in the testis, we are constantly doing this. These spermatogonia are reproducing, and then some of them undergo meiosis to produce spermatocytes, which then split up into um, additional spermatocytes, which eventually mature into sperm. Those sperm move out of these seminiferous tubules to the epididymis, where they're stored. So the, ma the matured sperm are stored in the epididymis. They're stored there until they either are ejaculated
Or if they don't get ejaculated in, in a little while, they just get broken down and recycled. I have heard uh, men occasionally believe that they need to have regular ejaculations or sperm will build up in the epididymis or their testis and it will explode. That is not how it works. Um, you produce sperm all the time and the ones that are older just get broken down. So we just sort of recycle the material. Uh, men produce sperm their entire lives. Compare that to uh, women who are born with all of the primary oocytes they, were, they will have. Men continue to produce new sperm throughout their lives, uh, which has some which has some interesting effects. It's why men don't undergo the same sort of menopause that uh, women do. In any case, so if, the, if we're going to ejaculate these sperm, during an ejaculation, sperm are taken from the epididymis, moved up the vas deferens. The vas deferens then combines them with various water, buffers, enzymes, mucus, uh, fructose, which is food for sperm, as well as sperm, all of that becomes semen, which is the fluid that is ejaculated from the penis. Uh, the sperm actually only make up a tiny part of that. Most of the rest of this stuff comes from the prostate gland, the seminal vesicles, and the bulbourethral glands. So we bring the sperm up the vas deferens and then we add stuff from these three areas, all this other stuff, water buffers, enzymes, mucus, and fructose, to make semen. Semen is about 1% sperm by volume. It's about 99% everything else. Which is why if a man has a vasectomy, meaning in a vasectomy we cut the vas deferens and then seal off the ends so that the sperm can't get out and they just stay stuck in here, the semen of a man who's had a vasectomy is not perceptibly different than someone who hasn't because the only thing missing from it is the sperm and those make up a pretty much insignificant fraction of the semen. It's just semen without sperm. Okay, let's talk about the process of fertilization. Uh, now here I'm going to be talking mostly about the idea of uh, fertilization in a female body. Uh, this can be done in vitro where you get sperm and egg together outside of the body. The basic process works similarly. Uh, obviously there are some differences. So just to, just so you know. Now in a typical ejaculation from a fertile male, there are about 200 million sperm. A good fraction of which um, are malformed or otherwise don't work properly, but there's a lot of viable sperm in a healthy ejaculation. And at, if the woman is at the right point in her uh, menstrual cycle, if this is uh, just pre or post just post ovulation, there will be one secondary oocyte generally. It's not impossible to have two or more, but usually one available to fertilize. So this is mostly going to happen if fertilization will happen if here's our ovary and here's our fallopian tube, which then leads to the uterus, so the sperm, let's just kind of sketch this out here. So here's our cervix and then here's the vagina. Sperm are generally ejaculated here in the vagina. They have to get through up the vagina, through the cervix, through the uterus, and into the fallopian tubes. The secondary oocyte is ovulated here from the ovary. That secondary oocyte is going to make its way into the fallopian tube, and it's here in the fallopian tube, some, usually somewhere in this part around here, where fertilization usually takes place. So the sperm have to move up here, all the way up this way, and it's in that area that they're going to encounter the egg. Now, it's worth noting that 
this one of the reasons you need 200 million sperm to have a decent chance at this is because this is a very hostile environment for sperm. The the vat the vagina and the uterus are both relative somewhat acidic environments, especially the vagina. That isn't very good for sperm, which is one of the reasons why semen contains buffers to help neutralize some of that acid. The uterine environment has a fair number of macrophages, which will catch and destroy sperm. It also has a bunch of sort of little dead ends in the wall that the sperm can get caught in. So there are fewer and fewer sperm coming up here. Now, also, if we're ovulating from this ovary, generally there's no ovulation from the one over here, which means half the sperm are going that way and there's nothing for them over there. So there are not a lot of sperm left by the time we get to here. But usually there are at least many dozens of sperm that get to this point. And if they run into a secondary oocyte that's been ovulated, there's the possibility of fertilization. So our secondary oocyte, shown here in red, is surrounded by some layers of sort of gelatinous material, the zona pellucida, it's called. And our sperm have to get through that. So that acrosome, that cap on the sperm, helps them to dissolve some of that zona pellucida. What we're going to focus on is what happens if this one sperm actually gets there. So here's a close-up. The moment that a sperm actually makes it through that zona pellucida and makes contact with the, with the secondary oocyte, this oocyte releases chemicals which harden the rest of the, the gelatinous material. So any sperm that hadn't already gotten there can't get through anymore. It makes it in, impermeable to sperm. This is our way of making sure that only one sperm cell gets to the egg. We don't want more than one fertilizing it. So here inside the egg, remember we had two sort of semi-nuclei. And our sperm cell contains a nucleus which gets put in here. So there's our sperm nucleus, and it is now going to fuse with one or the other of these nuclei, and which one it fuses with is entirely random. So, let's say it fuses with the one on the left. So, we have that nucleus and the sperm nucleus fusing forming a new diploid nucleus with the full set, full double set of chromosomes. And then we have the one remaining haploid nucleus. At that moment, this cell undergoes the second meiotic division. And it's definitely unequal. That second nucleus, that haploid nucleus gets split off, whereas our fused diploid nucleus gets most of the cell components. And so we end up with the second polar body which disintegrates. At least the last I heard, there's no known function to it. And the remaining diploid cell, which is a zygote. This is that cell which has the potential to develop into a fully fledged human being. So that process of fertilization usually happens here in the fallopian tube. It's then going to take four or five days usually for that fertilized egg to make its way to the uterus. So four or five days later, we get to the uterus. During that four or five days, this zygote is splitting. It's dividing and dividing and dividing
and so on. By the time it gets to the uterus, it's typically, typically I think eight cells by the time it gets there. And then it's going to keep dividing until it forms a hollow ball of about 100 cells that we call a blastocyst. This is where you are about four or five days after fertilization. You're in the roughly eight cell stage. Over the next couple of days, by getting to about eight days post-fertilization, you're gonna be at this blastocyst stage. And that's where we're gonna to have to implant in the wall of the uterus. And I wanna point something out on that one. So, take a look here. Here's where ovulation occurred. And fertilization, if it's gonna happen, usually happens within a few days of ovulation. So usually one to maybe four days later, somewhere in here. So if we get fertilized in here, and it takes us four days to get to the uterus, we're at the uterus here, and then we need another couple of days in order, then we need another couple of days in order to develop into an implantable version, the blastocyst. We're now at about day 22. We've only got a few days before that uterine lining gets ready to shed. So that process of implantation is gonna have to do something to cause us not to shed this uterine lining because if we implant and the uterine lining sheds, we'll lose this developing embryo. So let's talk a little bit about how that works. So here, we're now talking about our blastocyst having reached the uterus. So it's now coming down this way. Now it's in the uterus and we're at about eight days post-fertilization in the blastocyst stage. So that's probably about day 20, maybe 22 or 23 of the menstrual cycle. The blastocyst is going to burrow into the endometrium. and the endometrium is now going to grow over it. Remember, at this point, the corp back at the ovary, the corpus luteum is producing lots of progesterone, which is encouraging that uterine lining to grow. I'll make a note of that over here. Corpus luteum in the ovary is producing progesterone. So this implanted blastocyst then starts to actually push some of its cells deeper into the endometrium. So this blastocyst forms the big an early version of the placenta. The placenta is this really interesting organ that comes from the embryo. The placenta is fetal tissue. It, it's not from the mother, but it kind of pushes its way into the endometrium and interfaces with the maternal blood vessels in such a way as to allow exchange between the, between the growing uh, embryo's blood and the mother's blood. So you could, for example, you could almost imagine it like if here's the uterine wall and here's our endometrium. What we've got here is our blastocyst is embedded in that wall. And it starts to sort of put out 
these, it pushes little bits of itself deeper into the endometrium. So let's take a close up look at that, at that area. So our blastocyst cells are forming a place where some of these special maternal blood vessels are actually going to burst and form these sort of blood-filled areas around parts of this placenta. That's going to allow materials from the mother's blood to diffuse across that barrier into fetal blood. These will eventually develop into fetal blood vessels in here, which will then allow exchange of materials between the mother's body and the growing embryo. Now, this is all, we're growing this placenta over the next couple of days. So now we're getting toward day 24, 25 of the menstrual cycle. Remember at day 28, we're going to shed that endometrium. So this early placenta, once it grows enough, begins to secrete a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin. usually just abbreviated HCG. That's a hormone that then goes into the mother's blood. It acts on the corpus luteum in the mother's ovary and tells it not to, de not to decay. So we tell that corpus luteum not to die off. And if the corpus luteum doesn't die off and continues to produce progesterone, so now the corpus luteum keeps making progesterone, which means we don't shed the endometrial lining. and you don't get bleeding. And of course, missing that period is one of the signs that a person might be pregnant, that you miss it because the implanted blastocyst is now has made a placenta, which is making enough HCG to tell the corpus luteum not to degrade. If you remember back on here, it's the loss of this progesterone that causes the, the endometrial lining to decay. If we kept that progesterone high, which we will if the corpus luteum remains, then the endometrial lining will persist and still stay healthy, and our implanted blastocyst will not get shed. And then the person is pregnant. The pee on a stick type pregnancy tests that you can buy generally test for the presence of this hormone, HCG. Uh, because since it's produced very, very early, pretty much immediately after the placenta starts to grow, it's one of the earliest detectable things that tells you for sure that the that the woman's body is preg that a woman is pregnant. You can start to detect HCG generally about the time of the first missed period. So, once we've implanted and had a successful implantation and convinced the mother's body not to shed the uterine lining, then this blastocyst can continue to grow and start to become a full, an embryo and then a fetus and then eventually a human baby that can be delivered during the process of labor and delivery, which we are not going to get into right now. So our final topic we're going to talk about is we've talked now about how fertilization and pregnancy can begin. What we're now going to talk about is methods of contraception. In other words, how do people avoid having pregnancy begin? Okay, let's talk for a little bit about contraception, which is kind of an interesting thing to talk about. It's one of the times when we talk about preventing the human body from doing one of the things that it's meant to do. Uh, contraception is using various ways to prevent pregnancy from happening, even though a person is having sex in a way that could produce pregnancy. 
Um, for some animals, this isn't really an issue. There are plenty of animals out there that are not, that don't really have sex unless they are at a place where it's suitable to get pregnant. And while it's true that in the human menstrual cycle, really your main window for fertility is pretty much right around here, from just a little before ovulation to a little bit after. During the rest of that, pregnancy is very unlikely, not impossible, but very unlikely. In humans, there are relatively few obvious signs that a woman is fertile, which means that we can't really time, we, it's much harder for us to time sexual intercourse to maximize the chances of fertility, of pregnancy. People do it. There are signs if you know what to look for, uh, but it's relatively difficult. We don't have big obvious changes. There is debate about this, but there are some people who believe that that's partially related to the fact that sex in humans is not only a reproductive strategy. For humans, sex is also a social bonding strategy. It's part of how we interact with each other and how we form social bonds and social groups, which is part of which is important to our species. Now, for most of human history, probably people haven't tried to prevent pregnancy, but in recent centuries, many centuries actually, uh, people have wanted to have the option of having sex and having the social bonding that goes with that kind of sex. And here, of course, I am talking about heterosexual vaginal sex, which is far from the only thing in the human sexual experience. But that's the main one that can produce pregnancy, so that's the one we're talking about for the moment. People have wanted to have heterosexual vaginal sex without the possibility of getting pregnant. So they've worked on ways of, of preventing pregnancy. When we think about contraception right now, we think about it really kind of falling into several categories. There are ways of preventing ovulation. There are ways of preventing the sperm from reaching the egg. And there are, it is theoretically possible that you might prevent implantation of a fertilized egg. The vast majority of our methods focus on these two. So let's talk about those. Uh, preventing ovulation is one of the, well, actually, let's start over here. Preventing sperm from reaching the egg. This probably the simplest method of, actually, okay. The simplest method of contraception is abstinence not having sex. It is technically speaking the only method of contraception which is absolutely guaranteed to work, um, assuming you truly do not have any kind of sex, because if you get sperm near the vaginal opening, it is theoretically possible to become pregnant. But if you either have no kind of sex or just have a kind of sex where the sperm never get anywhere near the vagina, that is theoretically 100% effective at avoiding pregnancy. However, there are effective contraception methods which while they are not 100% effective, are very likely to be effective. So those are the ones we're going to talk about. Probably the simplest one is the use of the condom, which is, of course, a barrier, a sheath that fits either over the penis for a what they call the male condom or external condom, or in the vagina or other areas for the internal condom, sometimes called the female condom. But these condoms just provide a physical barrier that sperm can't get through, so that even if the, so if the person ejaculates, the sperm never leaves the condom area and can't get into the woman's body, so it can't reach the egg. So condoms, whether male or female, as they're sometimes called, or external or internal, um, are a barrier method that prevents sperm from reaching the egg, so they are effective contraception. Uh, their success rate, if they're used very, very well, if they're used entirely properly, is quite high. However, it is easy to misuse condoms or to use them badly. So their actual success rate in more typical use is you know, substantial, but not, but not perfect. Uh, worthy of note, of the methods we're going to talk about, these are effectively the only ones that provide any protection against sexually transmitted diseases. Most of these other methods of contraception do absolutely nothing to protect you against disease. Okay, in any case... So condoms are one of the ways you prevent sperm from reaching the egg. There are some other ways, uh, diaphragms and cervical caps, 
But those are, I guess, very rarely used these days, so we don't really talk about them all that much. Now, there are some other methods. Um, for example, the IUDs, intrauterine devices, small things that are placed into the uterus, actually, interestingly, work also work by the same method, although not, they are not barrier methods. So there are two main kinds of IUDs. The copper IUD uh, is basically wound in copper wire. And for a long time, we weren't really sure why that prevented pregnancy. Having this copper wire thing stuck into your uterus seemed to uh, work to minimize the chance of pregnancy. We now think that it's because copper ions are very toxic to sperm. So by having all that copper in the all those copper ions in the uterus, any sperm that enter that area really get killed very quickly. There's also a hormonal IUD. Uh, the most common name I think is Marina. Uh, this hormonal IUD releases a very low dose of progesterone within the uterus. It does not work the same way as other hormonal birth control methods though. Um, we'll talk about those in a moment, but the hormonal IUD seems to work primarily by thickening the cervical mucus making it so that uh, sperm can't get from the vagina into the uterus. They may also affect the uterine environment, making it toxic to sperm that get through, although that's a little unclear. But primarily, they work by thickening the cervical mucus, as far as we can tell. IUDs are very successful birth control in general. Uh, once they're placed, they don't usually require any sort of intervention. They last for years, and generally, they're one of the most effective methods. Uh, chance of becoming pregnant when on a hormonal IUD is something like 0.2%. They're as effective as surgical sterilization methods. So those are two more methods that really what they do is prevent the sperm from reaching the egg. There are then, of course, surgical methods. So for males, there's the vasectomy. In a vasectomy, you cut that vas deferens, which takes the sperm from the testis uh, up into the body, thus preventing it from being in the semen. So the man may ejaculate, but there's no sperm in the semen, so it's impossible for pregnancy to occur. Uh, vasectomy is also very, very effective. Uh, there is a very slight chance of vasectomy reversing itself, which is one of the reasons why men who've had vasectomies, it's usually recommended that once every year or so they go in for uh, to check and make sure that it hasn't happened. But the chances of that are extremely small, especially with modern vasectomy methods. So in for women, an equivalent method would be tubal ligation, which is the cutting off of the fallopian tubes so that the there's no path where sperm can get to a, a, a secondary oocyte. The oocytes are still released from the ovaries. They just can't get into the uterus and the sperm can't get out of the uterus. So pregnancy becomes impossible. These are both extremely effective. Um, I will say though that the risks of tubal ligation are substantial, are noticeable. It's significant abdominal surgery. The risks of vasectomy are virtually zero. Vasectomy is done as an outpatient procedure uh, under local anesthesia. It, it can cause a week or so of moderate pain and swelling, which then goes away, and then there are really no other effects at all. Um, the only public service announcement I'll make there is, hey, uh, guys, if you are in a relationship with someone and you have decided that you are absolutely sure that neither of you wants to get, that you do not want to get pregnant, you're willing to make a permanent commitment to that effect, guys, step up and do the vasectomy. Tubal ligation is much more risky for the woman involved. Tu vasectomy is much less risky for you. In theory, both of these can be reversed sometimes. Uh, however, you should assume, if you're having one of those, that it is a permanent method. There are some experimental reversible methods for male, uh, male sterilization that involve putting something into the vas deferens that blocks the sperm, either a little plug or there's one that's currently uh, being worked on that's sort of a chemical treatment that in theory, both of those can be reversed easily and completely and, and uh, fertility would return instantly, but they would be almost completely effective until they're reversed. That would be great. I think that would be a, a lovely addition to have to our our possibilities. All right, so those are the main prevent sperm from reaching the egg methods. Now let's talk about some of the methods that are used to prevent ovulation. The most common one here is oral contraceptives, the pill. 
These are doses of estrogen and or progesterone. Some of them are progesterone only. And what they do, if we look back here at our menstrual cycle diagram, the reason that FSH and LH are so low here is because of this large amount of progesterone. So if you're taking a pill that has estrogen and progesterone, it suppresses FSH and LH. And you know that to get the surge that produces, in order to get ovulation, you have to have this big surge in LH. So if you're taking a pill that's got a lot of estrogen and or progesterone in it, that will suppress the, FS, the FSH and LH, preventing that surge and preventing ovulation. So well, oral contraceptives, what they do is prevent your ovaries from releasing any eggs which then means you can't become pregnant if there are no eggs released. Uh, the problems with oral contraceptives, they have some health issues. They also have some health pluses. Finding the particular mix of estrogen and progesterone, which works well with your particular physiology, can, be, can take a little while. Many women go through several, uh, they go through several attempts. They try different uh, particular formulations till they find one that, that they are comfortable with. They also have to be taken, depending on the pill, on a fairly precise schedule. And if you mistime it or miss a pill, fertility can return relatively quickly, but unpredictably. So missing a pill and then having sex can be a good way to get pregnant on a, without expecting to. Uh, there are These not only prevent ovulation, they also thicken the cervical mucus, uh, which also helps to prevent sperm from getting to the egg. So in that way, they have an aspect of this, but they are primarily about preventing ovulation. There are some similar methods, uh, Depo-Provera, which is injectable, and Norplant, which is a set of rods implanted under the skin that slowly release progesterone. Uh, these also work very well, and they have the advantage of not requiring as much uh, careful attention to routine as oral contraceptives. So many people are very happy with these, uh, with these implanted or injectable uh, hormonal methods. There are also emergency contraceptive methods. And there are several of these. The most common, sometimes under that name of Plan B, is effectively just a large dose of progesterone. So taking a, if, you've, if a person has unprotected sex, and then relatively quickly, within a couple of days, takes a large dose of progesterone, that progesterone will prevent ovulation if it hasn't already happened. So if you don't ovulate, you can't become pregnant. So taking that emergency contraception as quickly as possible after unprotected sex is very, very effective at, pre at preventing pregnancy because it stops ovulation. The, there are a couple of issues with that. If the person has already ovulated, this doesn't really do anything to prevent the pregnancy. And that kind of emergency contraception, the kind that's a large dose of progesterone, is very dependent on the person's weight as to how effective it is. Um, up above a certain weight, and it's not that heavy, it's, uh, we'd have to look it up, uh, it doesn't really have a very strong effect, and above a certain weight it has really no effect at all. That's not always made clear, so it's important to know that. There are other, um, other kinds of emergency contraception that are not weight dependent, and some of them are very, very effective. They sometimes have stronger side effects. Not that uh, emergency, not that the large progesterone dose doesn't have some side effects. It often does. But uh, some of the other methods have some other issues. Now, one common misconception, so to speak, about emergency contraception is that it is an abortion pill. And for Plan B, that is absolutely not the case. Plan B is just progesterone which is the hormone that your ovaries produce while you are pregnant. Uh, a dose of progesterone will do absolutely nothing to stop a pregnancy. Uh, it, won't even stop, it won't even stop ovulation if it's already occurred. One, some of the other methods of emergency contraception, in theory, could cause an abortion if, one has, if uh, the person is already pregnant. Although in the doses that they're given, uh, that's unlikely. There is an abortion pill, um, mifeprestone, also known as RU486, which if taken with a prostaglandin misoprostol, will chemically induce an abortion. Uh, that is not, however, nor typically used in that way as part of emergency contraception. So the usual kinds of emergency contraception are not abortifacients. They will not, they will not abort a pregnancy that has already established itself. All righty. Now, this last 
category of preventing implantation, there's some controversy over, over that. There is some evidence that hormonal IUDs and possibly even oral contraceptives can alter the uterine lining such that it is such that it does not allow implantation. The evidence on that is weak. And the last reports I read were that even if that is a possibility, that is certainly not the primary way by which these things work. Hormonal IUDs primarily work by preventing sperm from getting to the egg by uh, thickening the mucus and making it a sperm hostile environment. And oral contraceptives primarily work by preventing ovulation, also by thickening the cervical mucus. There is pretty good evidence that they do not have a strong effect on preventing implantation. But it is theoretically possible um, that that is, not their that is not their method of acting. And that is the end of the reproductive system.